Good afternoon and welcome to our internal medicine um, departmental grand rounds. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Moises Aron, who is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics and an academic med peds hospitalist at the Cleveland Clinic main campus. He serves in educational roles in both departments as core faculty for the internal medicine residency program and the pediatric hospital medicine fellowship program. He is the quality improvement officer for hospital medicine at the main campus and the medical director of blood management for the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I know Dr. Aron from a shared quality improvement training at the Internet Mountain Advanced Leadership Training Program in Salt Lake City, which was um, in 2012, it was a month long program and his passion for QI and resident education um, has just been very infectious. Um, so I'm glad to welcome here, him here today. He has an interest in uh, perioperative blood management and has spearheaded the judicious use of blood and blood product transfusion practices. And then in pediatrics, he focuses on perioperative management and co-management of medically complex children, as well as eating disorders and medical care of young adults and survivors of complex diseases of the childhood. Of childhood. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Aron. Thank you very much, Dr. Brooks. Um, I really appreciate the kind invitation and it is a pleasure and honor to be with you today. And I truly enjoy being with your resident yesterday, terrific morning report. So um, we are going to speak about the best evidence for utilization of blood products, either red blood cells, plasma or platelets. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So an outline for the presentation will be focusing on the anemia physiology, the evidence that supports transitional medicine. We will discuss the adverse effect of blood utilization based on the different trials, then discuss briefly about protocols to enhance anemia optimization. And then we'll discuss finally about the evidence for appropriate plasma and plated utilization. So giving a context, we have a patient that is 50 years old, uh, is uh, supposed to undergo a colectomy for ulcerative colitis. This was in March, 2020, the COVID time. Hemoglobin is eight, and the patient anesthesiologist requests to transfuse before the operation a unit of red blood cells because the patient needs to enhance oxygen delivery. What would be the reason to disagree? could be either the threshold for transfusion is less than seven, you can optimize preload or you can optimize oxygenation or all of the above. So this slide is something I discuss with my resident all the time and every single service. So we speak about the different determinants that enhances oxygen delivery. And this is fundamental. Uh, we acknowledge uh, first of all, for the mean arterial pr pressure, the product the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. And for the oxygen delivery, cardiac output times your arterial content of oxygen. So for this equation, we divide it in the different uh, uh, components. Cardiac output will be the product of the stroke volume times your heart rate. And the stroke volume will be determined by your preload afterload and contractility. And of course, we discussed about different things that enhance the preload, afterload and contractility. For instance, renal function, fluid absorption, the appropriate uh, secretion of anti antidiuretic hormone, appropriate adrenal function, and so forth. Thyroid uh, function for heart rate and for contractility, and, and so forth. And arterial content of oxygen will be the product of the saturation time, the amount of oxygen per gram of hemoglobin. And when we speak about the saturation, well, I, I ask them to think about all the different causes for hypoxemia, either VQ mismatch or shunt or increased uh, diffusion space, hypoventilation or decrease FIO2 or high altitude. And how can we modify those to enhance oxygenation. And for the uh, hemoglobin, well, what are the things that we can do basically optimizing hematinics and minimizing bleeding. Now, when we look at the response to anemia, there's a right shift of the LC hemoglobin dissociation curve. And we'll have both bore and halen effect allowed for gaseous exchange at the tissue level. 
Now, when we look at uh, the, the, the most common cause for dietary um, deficiency anemia will be iron deficiency, which is absorbed in the duodenal cell. And there will be different types of absorption, will be the im iron, non-im iron, and a third way that is uh, not well known. And we know that the ferric iron gets uh, reduced to ferrous iron by the cytochrome B in the duodenal duodenal uh, broad border, and the divalent metal transporter will absorb it inside the cell. Now, it will go through the ferroportin in, in the ferro state, and hepatin will oxidize it to ferric state. Now, when we look at the transferrin, each transferrin molecule can transport two molecules of iron, when ferritin has actually hundreds of molecules of iron. What the relevance of this is that paradoxically, when there's an increase in the amount of iron that is getting um, absorbed, and especially in, in these states, there's an increased production of capsidin. So when there's inflammation, and most of our patients are in an inflammatory state, there's an increase of liver production of hepcidin, and this hepcidin will actually impair the hepatin uh, production and the hepatin function, and will actually avoid appropriate iron absorption, and also will impair the release of iron from the reticuloendothelial system. So I will be speaking in the iron supplementation section, how can uh, we in, in decrease the production of hepcidin by decreasing the frequency of iron um, supplementation by mouth. So in this case, the response is D is all of the above. So, so you have, you can optimize other variables except then just giving blood. So because of COVID, uh, surgery was postponed and the surgeon decided to evaluate imatinix and replace them parenterally. So when the patient comes back, hemoglobin is 11. What are the outcomes? What are the expected outcomes from this? Are we decreasing transfusion rate, decreasing morbidity, decreasing mortality, or all of the above? We need to understand that the patient population is aging. So this is a, a study of an Asian population, but what is basically translates very well to all of them. And we can see that in the premenopausal age, females will carry the highest prevalence of anemia as compared with the male counterpart. However, after the menopause, there's actually a parity of both sexes, both genders, and furthermore, afterward, even male patients will have a higher prevalence of anemia. So the prevalence of anemia increases with age. And sometimes in the preoperative clinic at Cleveland Clinic, impact clinic, uh, we have an average age of 70 to 80 years old for the whole entire day of clinic. So it's an elderly surgical population, and we need to uh, acknowledge that uh, they may be anemic. Now, in this study of 227,000 patients, where 70,000 had pre-op anemia, when the anemia was not optimized, it compared an increase of 35 to 42 risk of mortality and morbidity as compared with non-anemic patients. In cardiac surgical patients, we need to understand we, in the Cleveland Clinic, we do not see cardiac surgery patients. Those get seen exclusively in the Heart and Vascular Institute. We take care of the non-cardiac surgery. However, it's important to acknowledge uh, this data, and you are probably part of this, is the Virginia Cardiac Service Quality Initiative. When the patient had a lower metacrit, it correlated with increased mortality, increased rate of transfusion, and increased rate of renal failure. And lately, a lot of research in uh, parsimonial transfusional approaches, meaning I'm aiming to, to avoid transfusing platelets, is aiming uh, renal failure, as we will discuss subsequently. Now, this is a very interesting study. They were able to differentiate the patient who had no anemia versus anemia, and in both groups, differentiate whether there were no iron deficiency versus iron deficiency. And as you can see, the great body is iron deficiency in all the groups. The presence of iron deficiency, even if you are not anemic, correlate with increased mortality, serious adverse event, and major adverse cardiac uh, complication. So iron deficiency by itself, even in the setting of no anemia, uh, confers a higher risk of adverse outcome. Now, this is from the MET study, 
And this is this, a, a sub story of this where they basically assess that the presence of uh, the correlation of anemia with the magi- maximum oxygen uptake and the anaerobic threshold. And we'll see that when the patients are anemic, it will have a decrease in the oxygen uptake and a decrease in the threshold. And this is very relevant, as I have told you. We see mostly uh, elderly patients. We need to anticipate that they will be anemic. And they may tell you they are unable to perform in the DAST index an appropriate uh, rate of exercise. And you may think that they are not having the appropriate physical capacity, but you don't know how much it is impacted by the anemia. Therefore, in this case, optimization of anemia has a positive impact in all the different outcomes. I have told you that anemia by itself, when it's not optimized, is conferred with an increased morbidity and mortality. Now, what? So, if if, uh, if that's the case, what should we do to optimize? What is the core of hemoglobin value to transduce or optimize? Uh, the 1030 hemoglobin of 10 and a crit of 30 as a threshold to transduce has is still been done in a lot of countries and by a lot of practice, even in the United States. This has been based in experience, and this is based on studies by two OBGYN, Adams and Longley in the 1940s, the only studies that they did in the previous decade in dogs, and had no substantial evidence to support it, leading to an indiscriminate use of blood. And if we know that one unit of blood costs between $700 to $1,000, you can uh, make the math. So this is left for the NIH to um, critically appraise these ranges and saying that maybe lower threshold could be necessary and it ignited all the research. So this led to a variety of studies in the decade of the 1990s on normal volumic hemodilution. And this was done in different settings, mostly in cardiac patients, uh, healthy elderly patients, uh, in cardiac patients, uh, but also assessing it with uh, invasive or echocardiography um, uh, measurement or monitoring. And what they found is that most of the patients were able to tolerate an hemoglobin decrease from 12 to 9 or 12 to 8 with no significant changes in the EKG with an appropriate increase in the cardiac index. And the patient had absolutely no uh, adverse uh, uh, coronary symptom. Now, in these studies, they did not track troponin, they did not track anti-proBNP. However, um, these studies led to the subsequent uh, trials. Now, this, this led to, okay, if these patients are able to tolerate anemia, let's go to a more uh, aggressive threshold. And they went all the way down to seven and finding that the, the, the speed of mathematic operation when the patient had an hemoglobin of seven was similar as the normal hemoglobin of 14 or more. However, when the hemoglobin decreased, there was a delay in the mathematical operation, the speed of reaction. However, when the patient got transfused back to the hemoglobin of seven, they recover uh, the ability of mathematical speed of reaction. So this is the study that allowed uh, all the clinicians to acknowledge that the core of value of seven will be safe for a normal brain function. So how can we apply this to real life patients? Because we need to make sure we are not applying these in, in clinical contexts that are not relevant. So this led to all the different evidence and um, just summarizing them, you can see all the uh, tra- restrictive threshold that all the trials had either seven, eight or 7.5. Perhaps the single one that you need to know is the Harvard trial, the TRIP trial. This is the, this is the seminal one. This is what led all of them. These were very sick medical ICU patients, and they found that restrictive level had no impact in outcome as compared with a higher threshold. And as a matter of fact, higher threshold had worse outcome in more. Now, when you say, well, what about the patients who are septic? Well, we had a study in infectious diseases in a, published by Holt in the New England Journal of Medicine 2014, found the same outcome when you have restrictive threshold. When you say, well, but I have patients that are surgical patients, they're high risk surgical, I cannot 
Well, we have the focus study that was done in elderly orthopedic surgery, going into hip replacement, who had high cardiovascular risk. So it was high cardiovascular risk patient. And they found that the core of value of eight had the same value, uh, same outcome as higher threshold. Now you could argue, well, what my patient is bleeding. This is a moving target. Well, we have the study done in Barcelona by Villanueva or the Lancet study in 2015 in severe GI bleeding. And they also found that this patient had the same outcome. Now, the most recent evidence has been published in cardiac surgery, surgical patients. The most recent one is the reality trial. This was actually an acute MI patient. This is a non-surgical patient. And they actually found that a core of value of eight has the same outcome as higher threshold. So, and I spoke with you about um, acute renal uh, failure. Well, this is from the study by Guard. They found this in cardiac surgical patient from the Virginia Cardiac Surgical uh, Quality Initiative. They were, they were seeing that lower MRR risk had higher risk of AKI. Well, they look here at the development of AKI with anemia, and they found that these patients were able to tolerate hemoglobin of 7.5 without it uh, uh, worsening the renal function. So, um, and, and, and again, this is the, the risk of infection when you transfuse patients. And, and when you have a restrictive threshold, you decrease substantially the rate of, the, of infection as compared with the liberal threshold. So this has led to the guideline from the American Association for Blood Banking, where they recommend a threshold of seven for all hemodynamically stable patients, inclu including critically ill, and a threshold of eight for a patient with pre-existing and active coronary artery disease or, pre or severe um, coronary cardiovascular disease, or well, though undergoing cardiac surgery or orthopedic surgery. Now, to be maintained, acute coronary syndrome, patients who depend on transfusion, well, you need to transfuse them. I mean, bone marrow transplant patient, patient on chemo. And furthermore, if you have a red blood cell of any uh, duration of storage life, you can use it with no risk of adverse reaction. Now, what about sickle cell disease? We see a lot of sickle cell disease and the TAPS trial, this is another seminal uh, study we need to know. Uh, they recommend to have a threshold of 10 before surgery. So this is important. This is just for surgical population. So if the patient with sickle cell disease who are going to have surgery, they recommend to have an hemoglobin of 10 or above before operation to minimize the risk of adverse uh, reaction. So the next case, we have a patient who had a hysterectomy. She was in the ICU. She has required throughout her hospitalization, a total of three units of blood. Um, her hemoglobin is reported to be 7.1. What would be the next step? With the, with the moving target, which you transfuse, maybe replacing hematinics, or perhaps evaluating for source control or BNC. So when we transfuse, how, no, how much is enough to cause damage? And we have evidence from ICU population, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Database from American College of Surgeons, as well as the premier claim-based data. And we found that when the patient gets transfused more than four units, they have an increased risk of mortality, an increased risk of infection, increased risk of length of stay, and increased risk of stroke or myocardial infarction. So when I get patients that are coming to my service from the ICU or well from the, uh, having a prolonged hospitalization, I ask my resident, let's check in the intake and output and let's check in the nursing uh, uh, spread sheet, flow sheets, how many units of blood this patient has this patient received. Why? Because if they have received three, then we say, you know what? Let's hold on giving more blood. Let's find out if they're bleeding. Let's optimize hematinics. Let's try to optimize other things rather than transfusing the patient. Why? Because if we give four or more, the likelihood of bad outcome is, uh, is compelling. 
In addition, when we are transducing, the risk of transition overload is probably the most common one that we can have. And this is more common than trally and is more common than viral infection. As a matter of fact, the risk of a viral infection with transfusion is almost the same as getting hit by a liver. So in this case, replacing hematinix and evaluating for source control will be the next step for management. So we have discussed so far that anemia increases morbidity and mortality. The use of the liberal use of blood is associated with a bad outcome. Therefore, we should pursue non-transitional effort in order to enhance optimization of anemia. The choosing wisely has led to a variety of recommendations aiming to minimize the use of blood. They say, do not transfuse blood cell in a hemodynamically stable with a, a patient with hemoglobin more than seven. I like this one. Do not give red cell to young healthy patients that are not having blood losses and the hemoglobin is more than six, unless they are symptomatic or hemodynamically unstable. As a matter of fact, patients with sickle cell, sometimes the hemoglobin is six or, or less than six, they are stable, we don't transfuse them. I mean, they, we allow them to, to have a tolerance for anemia. Now, if they are unstable, of course, well, this, that's common sense. But most of them uh, makes us to reflect on the practices that we do. So uh, what should be the protocol for enhancing non-transfusional anemia optimization? So this is a cave in Iceland, these are iron depot, deposits in the, in the wall. And this is a, a very interesting review article. I would recommend all of you to have it handy. This is from Anesthesia and Analgesia, either April or May 2020. And it was the most comprehensive review on preoperative anemia optimization. And basically the patient having anemia, the first indication is review iron status, iron stores. Why? Because that's the most common cause for anemia from nutritional deficiency. And the efficiency of iron is defined as a saturation of transferrin less than 20%, ferritin level less than 100, or a reticulocyte hemoglobin content of less than 30%. So these are the values that we need to acknowledge. Now, if they are normal, then they look for the B12 or the folate uh, levels. If they are normal, then looking for reticulocyte content. And if this is a uh, low or normal, then think whether the patient may have anemia of chronic disease or, or anemia of uh, chronic kidney disease. Now, this is a very interesting algorithm. The recommendation by the American uh, Gastroenterology Association published in uh, August of 2020. They think in the patient who have anemia and they have no other uh, risk factors for anemia and ferritin is, is uh, less than 45, they define this as iron deficiency. Now I have told you that 100 is the value that we actually use for most patients, but actually either any of you right now, you should have about 45. Um, if anybody has chronic kidney disease, the patient has coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, then 100 or more should be expected as part of um, iron uh, uh, deposition and related to inflammation. Now, the recommendation is the evaluation with bidirectional endoscopy. And then if there is no etiology that's identified then just do an iron replacement and reassess the patient. And if the anemia persists despite iron replacement, then do capsule endoscopy. And also, if there's a concern for celiac disease, to do a serology before doing random biopsies or routine biopsies. So this actually changed my practice because when I have a patient who's coming with significant anemia and there's a concern for GI bleeding, I actually order the three studies at the same time. And I have a, an indication in EPIC. So pursue first with the colonoscopy. If the colonoscopy is negative, then go ahead with the EGD. If the EGD is negative, then with the EGD drop a capsule on the patient. So um, this allows to have, but now in order to have a high value care approach, we will do the bidirectional endoscopy and then we will hold the capsule, we rather optimize iron and then do the capsule and it makes perfect sense. 
Now, when we're thinking about replacing iron and uh, we want to bypass the poor enteral um, absorption that can happen with anemia of chronic disease, um, we can use parenteral iron. And there's a variety of uh, formulation. We do have low molecular weight that trend. Nobody uses a high molecular weight because of the risk of anaphylaxis. Low molecular weight has a substantially less risk than, of anaphylaxis and we can give a whole gram together. In the Cleveland Clinic, what we use is a ferric gluconate in the inpatient and ferric sucrose, iron sucrose in the outpatient. Um, iron sucrose has a safer uh, profile of all of them. We were using also ferric carboxymaltose, but we are taking it away from the formulary because this has a high risk of hypophosphatemia. And we're checking, uh, changing to a different type of uh, maltose. I think it's, uh, I don't recall the exact, the exact name of the compound, but uh, this one has a high risk of hypophosphatemia. We were very excited because we could give a dose of, one point, of 750 milligrams uh, once a week, every other week. But the new formulation, we can give a gram together. Now, when we talk about the safety, I have told you iron sucrose has the less risk of anaphylaxis. Most of the reactions are actually anaphylactic reactions. And the most recent study uh, published in, uh, uh, last year in Transfusion found that the hypersensitivity reaction happened in less than 1.7% of patients receiving any type of parenteral IV iron. Now, uh, this study uh, that was also published last year, the, uh, the basically this is a very large one, 13,000 infusion. Only 1.4 actually have significant reaction. And from this one, they were able to recommend the same infusion in 33 patients and tolerated the, the, in all of them. And patients who had just transient flushing or myalgia, that's called fish vein. Patients with mild reaction we may have some transient rash or moderate reaction would have some nausea, dyspnea, or transient hypotension. Now, they were able to re-challenge in uh, 69 patients and basically able to tolerate in pretty much all of them. So uh, basically two thirds of these patients were able to tolerate uh, either the recommencement of the infusion or challenge with different preparation. So this is really important because some patients have fish vein or mild reaction and nurses in the infusion tenors label it as uh, a completely adverse reaction and they are afraid and label it as an allergy and patient cannot get parenteral iron and that is not necessary. Now, when we are able to um, replete oral iron, if somebody is going to have an operation in six months from now, I always say my, my GYN colleague or orthopedic, you have that lady that you're planning to do a hysterectomy maybe in six months to a year. You have that that patient who are planning in doing a hip replacement and knee replacement. Why don't you assess for the anemia right now and optimize it? Try to find out if they have a maternic deficiency and optimize the maternic deficiency. And uh, you can optimize oral iron. And if you have six months, it's more than plenty to correct the anemia. And these studies are very interesting where they found that using alternate dosing every other day one dose at night time, you decrease hepcidin release and you enhance iron absorption. So the recommendation in, in our practice is to do this. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one dose at night time, they can take that for several months and often replete hemoglobin in a very nice way. Now, a lot of people have asked me how much vitamin D should patients patient take. Well, the American Hospital Formulary Service they recommend doing 200 milligrams of vitamin C for 30 milligrams of elemental iron. Some people tell me, uh, well, can we just give them a cup of orange juice? Sure, you can do that. I mean, in reality, patients could probably take it with not, not getting additional vitamin C. But if you want to give the, the orange juice, one cup of orange juice only has 72 milligrams of vitamin C. So maybe the patient needs to drink a lot of orange juice to get those 500 milligrams. And why 500 milligrams? Because one tablet of ferric sulfate, that is a 325 milligrams, has 60 milligrams of elemental iron. So you would need 400 milligrams of ascorbic acid to absorb that. 
So there will be a lot of sugar here. Now, you can use IV iron in the outpatient uh, clinic too. This is a study of patients with GYM bleeding, GI bleeding, or malabsorption who have um, like an immune hemoglobin of 6.5. And basically, they replace 1.5 grams of IV iron. And that raised the median of hemoglobin about 5.7 grams per deciliter with enhancement of patient symptoms. So this is a more, all this is very recent data that was not existing before. And you can use it as a, as a choice for uh, optimizing iron deficiency anemia in stable patients have no symptoms before even transfusion. And of course, you should control the source for bleeding. Now, in surgical population, we have data of different settings. In colorectal surgery, when we screen for anemia, this is the, the uh, cost effectiveness of screening anemia. is in the United States population. You cut down by 50% the rate of transfusion when the patient arrives to surgery and decreased uh, overall cost by $2,600. Now, in orthopedic surgical patients, when you optimize anemia with IV iron infusion, you decrease transition rate by 30%, decrease length of stay by almost two days, and you cut down by one third the rate of infection. And also, it is the, in general, a surgical population, you, uh, when you do supplementation of iron more than seven days before surgery, you decrease the rate of transition about one unit, you cut down about three days, the rate of hostile stay. And this is a pool of studies, uh, mostly in Spain and Europe. And uh, basically they pull 800 patients. And uh, basically there was a cut down of 50% uh, uh, in the rate of mortality and a 65% uh, decrease in the rate of transition. Now, in heart failure population, checking for iron and optimizing iron is a hot potato right now. Everybody's doing that, at least in the Cleveland Clinic. There's a lot of IV iron infusion for heart failure patients, which decreases the overall hospitalization frequency and mortality from cardiovascular and heart failure composite, cardiovascular individual, heart failure individual as well. Now, if you have a patient who is coming to surgery or a patient with severe anemia, let's say a, a Jehovah Witness patient who does not accept blood, this is a fantastic story of quadruple therapy. And basically, they, they, they gave a combination of 20 milligrams of ferric carboximal dose parenteral, 40,000 units of EPO alpha, one milligram of subcute vitamin B12, and five milligrams of folic acid on the day of surgery. So this decreased the rate uh, from a million of one unit down to zero unit. So you cut down about 30% the rate of transition. And you can see that after three days, there's a, a continuous increase in hemoglobin level in the reticulocyte count and the uh, reticulocyte hemoglobin content. And um, of course, nothing can always be clean and sleek. Uh, about six months ago in September, they published the PREVENT trial. And this is a small study, almost 500 patients uh, that were undergoing abdominal surgery, elective abdominal surgery. And this patient, all of them, they have IV iron administration up to a month and a half. And they found that there was no changes in the rate of blood transfusion or death. And um, however, when we look at sub study, um, the use of IV iron had a decrease in the rate of readmission compared with the patient that required placebo. And even readmission at six months was also uh, decreased, although not statistically significant. But the overall total number of readmission was significantly decreased by almost 40%. So for the hospitalist, and uh, that we get chased for the uh, rate of readmission, this carries a significant value. Now, um, briefly, when patients do not want transfusion whatsoever, the only product that we use, a blood substitute is Hemapure, is a bovine hemoglobin that is polymerized with glutaraldehyde. This, can, this has been used in phase three studies. This has been used within the context of perioperative transfusion. 
in cardiac surgery patients that undergo acute normobolemic hemodilution, as well as Jehovah patient that does not accept uh, blood. It's not tolerated because it, it requires a large volume in elderly patients or patients with pre-existing cardiac disease. The use of this product can cause methemoglobinemia, which if the patient has already an underlying significant anemia, this can actually worsen the, the clinical picture. So we need to correct that right away and can also cause hypertension because of the volume and impair uh, transaminase. Now, these are, these are the summary of all the trials using uh, this product in patients who do not uh, want to get blood, blood not an option. And basically we see, these are very small numbers, of course. Um, the largest study is 54 patients in people with severe anemia. And uh, the, the survival rate is 41%. But the, the use of oxygen carrier did not have a significant impact in the patient mortality. And so this is data that is growing, it was just published either last month or this month in anesthesia and analgesia. It's a great review on this product. And um, so um, this is, uh, you have to request permission to the FDA to administer it when the patient comes. And the laboratory that produces Hemapure is the one who will supply it uh, on an individual basis. So blood management, it associated with a decrease in transition rate, decrease in, in all that bad outcome, infection, renal failure, thromboembolism, mortality. I mean, mortality gets decreased by 10%, that, that's uh, significant. And of course, uh, you decrease the length of stay and uh, transition for any acute hospitalization. Now, this study was published this month, and this is the editorial summarizing the main article. But basically, when you do pre-op anemia screening in all surgical patients, when this is in Australia, an investment of 300 Australian dollars, the when you use IV iron, it increases in general about an average of one gram per deciliter in your hemoglobin. They cut down the rate of transition by 50%, and the overall downstream cost is decreased by six to seven thousand Australian dollars. So I mean, this is a food for the talk. If there is not a blood management program in a given hospital or, or, or a medical or healthcare organization, it is an opportunity for implementation. Now, uh, very briefly, we'll speak about fresh frozen plasma evidence. Uh, so the fresh frozen plasma is the liquid component of blood that has most of the proteins. Um, is the most commonly prescribed hemostatic agent worldwide and up to 60% is transfused inappropriately, either over transfused or under transfused. So we have a case of a cirrhotic patient that requires paracentesis, INR is 1.9. How many units of plasma should we do? Two, three, or four. So first of all, we need to understand the correlation between um, the INR and the percentage of coagulation factor. And most of the time, when the INR is two or less, most of the coagulation factors will be above 30%. And about 30% of all the coagulation factor is the sound of normal hemostasis. Now, I need to tell you that there's the, there's the different code of values for all the different coagulation factors. The place where you really consistently have less than 30% of all of them is when your INR is actually above three. And some studies actually show 3.5. But for the sake of simplicity and for the sake of uh, the patient who uses uh, warfarin or the patient with uh, cirrhosis, who will consider that in out of two, those patients have more than 30%. And there is probably a low likelihood of optimization of these levels with additional plasma transfusion. Now, in patients with an INR less than two, this is a study in the mass general, and they found that basically 99% failed to correct the INR level, regardless of the number of units that were utilized. So this is, this is very relevant because when you are, uh, your INR is less than two, you're probably already having the normal amount of coagulation protein. Now, furthermore, this is in, in surgical uh, patients, 
Um, most of the time, uh, the, the, the change in your INR will be uh, very little when the patient hemoglobin is less than two. However, when the uh, INR, I, I said hemoglobin, so sorry, INR, but when your INR is above three, then you will have a more meaningful change in your INR with, with plasma transfusion. Now, furthermore, when you use more than three units, there's a higher likelihood of normalization and changing in the INR level. Why is this important? Well, because the appropriate transfusion of plasma should be dosed by weight. The normal weight, this is the British Society of Hematology recommendation, 15 to 20 mL per kilogram. In our institution, we use 10 to 15 mL per kilogram. And you can see that the patient with 60 kilograms, based on the British Society of Hematology recommendation, 12 mL per kilogram, this would equal three units of plasma. This is not one, it's not two, it's three. And we found, uh, interestingly, that in our institution, several providers were actually transfusing one unit of plasma. When we did, we did a deep dive, and they were giving one unit of plasma for a patient with an INR of 1.9 or 1.8. Why did you do that? Well, to, to minimize risk of bleeding, I understand, but the, 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 there's no knowledge about uh, coagulation and, and plasma. There's no knowledge about clotting factors percentage. I mean, when we do an inquiry, they are just doing that in an arbitrary fashion. So if a strong educational endeavor have to be pursued across the whole entire procedural services. And this has led to a decrease in the inappropriate uh, utilization of a single unit transfusion. If you are going to transfuse, you have to use per way. And ideally, when your INR is above two or even above three. Now, this volume will, of course, increase the risk of circulatory overload. This is, so it's important to acknowledge this, especially in elderly patients or patients with pre-existing cardiac disease. Therefore, we have to individualize the treatment. If the patient is not bleeding and this is just an arbitrary INR correction, you may withhold it. You'd rather give vitamin K. If the patient is bleeding and you need rapid correction, you may use four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate. Now, what about the cirrhotic patient? When you give this amount of, uh, of plasma, you increase the portal pressure because it's a large volume. You increase the risk of circulatory overload and transition reaction. Most of the time, the plasma will have a minimal effect on thrombin generation. You increase the portal pressure with the risk of, of rupturing those varices or enhancing the variceal bleeding. Therefore, using four-factor prothrombin complex concentrates become quite attractive in this population. Now, very interestingly, the patient with cirrhosis have a rebalanced coagulation cascade. So in the late 2000, uh, 2000 in 2009, Tripoli had a seminal study finding that the patient with cirrhosis, there has an increased amount of thrombin levels and generation when they assess by the endogenous thrombin potential. This is very interesting, and this is compared with healthy patients and compared with a uh, with a patient with cirrhosis that had um, lower um, um, that's child child A or child B. Now, protein C deficiency is going to be also uh, the, the 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 decrease also in patient with cirrhosis. So there's increased tissue factor, there's increased factor eight level, there's increasing form around. But of course, there's a decrease in protein CNS and there's an increased thrombin generation. So there's a risk for thrombosis in this patient. We cannot use in a liberal fashion the transition of plasma. The guideline from the uh, liver uh, organization, either in the United States or Euro Europe, they do not recommend plasma or plated in a routine fashion before paracentesis. So there is no need to transfuse this patient. And now, what I want to use for a patient that uses warfarin. So the guideline from ACCPB or AABB, they recommend rather using vitamin K or using four-factor prothrombin complex concentrate in the patient is actively bleeding. In reality, you can just withhold if the patient is not bleeding, withhold warfarin and uh, may give them more salads or you just um, 
give them a part of subcutaneous or IV vitamin K. Now, we need to understand that the factors are already synthesized. They only need the final conversion step. So you carboxylate the factor and render them active. Vitamin K will work fast in this population. Now, when you compare the, the, the patient who's actively bleeding and you compare, uh, and they're taking what I mean, you give vitamin K, it will act fast, but for factor protomine complex concentrate, we have a very rapid correction of your INR within the first hour as compared with the plasma transition. And of course, with a less risk of transitional reaction. <laughs> but the next case is a patient with osteomyelitis on dialysis. She cannot get a peak line. She needs a central line for IV antibiotics. INR is two. So how much plasma does she need? Once again, I will just give you right here the ra interventional radiology guidelines, Society for Interventional Radiology guidelines. These are the guidelines that we are using here in our institution to guide the threshold for plasma and platelet. They, there's no, if the patient has a non liver disease and there's low risk for bleeding, there is no need to check coagulation profile. If you have done, if the INR with a range of two to three, it's okay to proceed without correcting it. If the plates are more than 20, it's okay to proceed without correcting it. Now, this includes um, the venous catheter placement, abscess drain, percutaneous abscess drain, transjugular liver biopsy, IBC filter, lumbar function. Now, there's high risk for bleeding, which will be solid organ biopsy, and the spine with risk for spinal epidural bleed, well, that's a high risk patient, the presence of tips, nephrostomy tube. Well, then if INR is less than 1.8, will be acceptable or plate that more than 50. Now, patients with cirrhosis, they would not care about the INR, it is a low risk of bleeding. And it will be okay to proceed if the plates are more than 20 or fibrinogen more than 100. But if the risk, the risk of bleeding is high, then INR should be desirable less than 2.5 or plate that's more than 30, and of course, fibrinogen more than 100. So in our Journal of Hostel Medicine, this was published in September. Basically, one of the things we do for no reason is routinely correcting the INR and thrombocytopenia before paracentesis in patients with cirrhosis. It's a very compelling review of, of all the evidence I have presented to you. So in this patient, we'll go to an interventional radiology place line. There is no need to give their platelets for an INR of 2.0. And this is what our intervention radiology in our institution, they follow this guideline. So we should not use FFP routinely just to correct INR arbitrarily. If the patient is bleeding, rather use vitamin K or four-factor protromin complex uh, concentrate. FFP for an INR less than 1.9 is unlikely to change outcome. In liver disease, you can proceed with procedure if the plates are more than 20, or high risk procedure if the INR is less than 2.5, or platelets more than 30. And very briefly, talking about platelets, um, uh, the, the, these are very expensive and have a very short half life. Plates are stored at a room temperature. Um, basically up to five days with a high risk of bacterial contamination. And in all the blood banks, every day I get a report of the blood product that we have. And we have a number of products for all the hospital, the number of patients that we have and procedure. And they are in the green level, yellow level, or red level. The one that is consistently on the yellow level, platelets. We are always struggling with having platelets. So this is very important to acknowledge. And they have the highest risk for immunization and the transition reaction. Mo they, people used to think that plates are very benign. They have a high risk for febrile reaction and an allergy, and they have the same risk as other uh, blood products. Now, when we transfuse a unit of plate that is equal to five plate concentrates, one dose is 200 ml. So 200 ml is not negligible. It's a substantial uh, amount of volume. You need to recall that 
we used to give boxes of 250 mils before. I mean, we, we moved all the way to the 500 mils and to the liters, and now we're going backwards because now less is more. So we used to give ball. I mean, 200 mils can be significant in an elderly patient. Most of them are pre pulled or by a person, and a unit of plated rice is plated about 30,000. This is important because if you have a patient who has uh, bone marrow or, or some chemo or has a hematologic problem, you may want to recheck platelets after transition and make sure they rise up to 30,000. Otherwise, if they do not rise that level or, or do not rise at all, that may be uh, a cause of refractory, platelet refractoriness, and they need to address that by hematology. Nowadays, is the way we are doing platelets in our institution. We do pathogen reduced platelets where they are treated with a photochemical process that inactivate pathogen and also prevent graft versus host disease. Therefore, we do not need to irradiate, so we don't have the irradiation still anymore. They come in a larger bag with the same amount of volume. So we have a case. Um, this patient uh, needs a lumbar puncture. He has meningismus, has been uh, in a prolonged hospitalization, and has fever with mental status changes. Platelet count is 25. How much should we uh, rise the platelets to prior to the lumbar puncture? So once again, the, there's no substantial evidence in procedures for plates, especially for central line insertion. The pocket trial was terminated because of lack of recruitment. In 2006, they could not extrapolate any data. Patient trial is ongoing, to aiming to randomize 400 patients to see the different threshold for platelets for central line. And also right now, there is no blind central line placement. I mean, I was trained to place subclavian, subclavian uh, blindly and uh, never had really any problem. But now we use ultrasound and we do internal jugular. So it's way safer to do uh, regardless of the number of platelets. There's a strong paucity of evidence for lumbar punctures and epidural anesthesia. Now, this study is very interesting. The past uh, trial was done in Europe, and they found in patients who had intracranial hemorrhage and who presented within six hours and that have received antiplatelet for seven days and were not in coma. And they gave 97 transfusion versus standard care. And when they compare, there was no change in mortality, no change in the sedation scores, in the ranking scores, and not change in the size of the hematoma at 24 hours. So routine plate transfusion had no significant impact in patient outcome. Now, don't get uh, overwhelmed by this. What I want to show you here, if the patient has an hemoglobin of 15, the patient has no anemia, in reality, the risk of transfusion uh, of the patient is going to be negligible for any level of platelet count. Now, in females, it may have a slight, slighter, very slight, barely slight from the statistical difference risk of transfusion if the plates are 50,000 or less. In male, if your hemoglobin is normal, Really, there's no risk of transfusion, even if your plates are 50,000. So with this, I'm showing you that really, in reality, checking for platelets in surgical population is not going to make that much difference if your patient hemoglobin is normal. However, if patient has anemia, well, certainly this is important because it could be a marker of bone marrow dysfunction. And this is data from uh, published online this month. So what are the guidelines, AABB, American Association of Blood Banking, and the British Society of Hematology, they recommend to use single units at any time for spontaneous bleeding, for platelets less than 10,000, for central line placement, less than 20,000, for lumbar puncture, less than 50,000, or 40,000, that's the British, or major elective surgery, less than 50,000, that's, that's a classic one, or nursery or ophthalmology for less than 100,000. Now, LP and central line, this is when it's done at the bedside. Now, remember, I told you that the interventional radiology guideline 
recommend for patients with non liver disease that there is no need to check this. And if you have done it, it is okay to proceed with an INR with a range of two to three or platelets more than 20 for, a, for central line or for lumbar puncture. So this patient already has more than 20. There is no need to transfuse platelets. Contraindication for platelet absolute is, of course, heparin induced thrombocytopenia or immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Now, if you have the patient who are having complications to platelet, they have refractory to platelet, they are bleeding, it's hard to keep them uh, in, in, in good number. Well, then we need to stop the bleeding. We need to optimize hemostasis. We need to optimize coagulation. So you can optimize uh, pump bilibrant expression with EDAVP, especially patient with uremia, patient on dialysis. Of course, optimizing anemia, we have stated in the first part of the presentation. So using a thrombo pack, romiplostin uh, for enhancing thrombopoietin. If, of course, the patient with sepsis or infection, well, you want to treat this to uh, avoid endothelial dysfunction and, of course, avoid uh, enhanced expression from bilabrain. Now, other thing that can be done is replacement, especially the Novo 7, replacement of uh, factor 7 using fibrinogen concentrates or factor 13. I mean, those can enhance the, 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 the clotting. Or in the patient having prominent, uh, we want to avoid the thrombolysis by using tranexamic acid or epsilon aminocaproic. So we have other ways to optimizing coagulopathy in our patients. So thinking outside of the box. So we keep evolving, we keep changing. Um, we used to, I mean, I have told you different ways to optimize platelet or optimize bleeding. We have ways to assess coagulopathy with thromboelastography or rotatory thromboelastometry, which has a, a geometric assessment of the clot formation and thrombolysis. And based on the geometric uh, thing, you can find if the patient may need plasma, cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate, platelet, or the uh, use of uh, antifibrinolytics. So combination of, uh, of this with the previous slide I showed you can guide your uh, decision-making. So we need to stay open to change, um, try to enhance uh, and, embrace, and embrace novel therapies, and minimize the liberal use of blood products. So with this, I conclude my presentation and I truly appreciate the invitation and your hospitality. And uh, thank you for being here with me and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Aran. Uh, I don't see any questions currently in the chat. Does anyone have any questions that they wanna ask or put in the chat? I'm thinking here the, the comment on no and juice if they have diabetes. Of <laughs> I mean, it, it has been interesting because um, uh, it, it is, a, it is a, we are actually moving away from, uh, from using juice in general. Uh, I was doing a peloton exercise last night and uh, the guy, the instructor, Cody, he was saying, oh, I, I desire so much to drink a white grape juice, but has a lot of sugar. So he said like uh, the mindfulness about glucose and juices. So we're changing the dietary approach. People are embracing healthier diet, but certainly for iron optimization, iron absorption, definitely uh, avoiding uh, uh, orange juice, rather using vitamin C supplementation. How do we use tech? Yeah, we use tech in, especially in cirrhotic patients. Uh, that's the most common scenario where we're using thromboelastography. The result comes back within an hour to two hours. It used to take a long time. Now it comes quite immediate. And that helps us to guide where they need plasma or where they need cryoprecipitate. Um, in some patients, uh, we may even given, especially before, um, liver transplantation using either factor seven or factor eight. Why? 
because you want to avoid transducing plasma before a transplant. Because the more you transduce a patient, the higher the likelihood of sub subsequent failure of the transplant. Why? Because you're exposing the patient to more, uh, it's more antigenic exposure. Um, so, uh, it, so basically we use thromboelastography mostly in cirrhotic patients. And it's expanding to other patients who have coagulopathy, who may have DIC, or patients who are having significant sepsis in the ICU, to have a much more precise guidance toward which is the best product to use. I mean, if you can use cryoprecipitates instead of plasma, that probably will save a lot of volume to the patient. And there's just one other question that I see in a different part of the chat, which mentions uh, when when would you use a bleeding time, which I don't think I've ever actually ordered that at BCU. So any use utility of the bleeding times anymore? Uh, not really. We, I mean, we used to do that a lot in the patient with significant or extreme, uh, extreme malnutrition. Uh, we used to do that. I mean, uh, in in the patient with hemophilia, we don't really do that. Um, it is it's, it's quite it's quite rare to do. I mean, we can now check for very specific um, fact coagulation factors levels. Yeah. Great, I think we're out of time, but thank you so much. And I hope that um, you enjoyed your virtual time at VCU. Well, I truly appreciate the invitation. <laughs> Good to see you again. Likewise, all the best, stay safe and warm. You too.